Electrochemical cells are a weird part of the MCAT because they show up in physics questions, gen chem questions, and even in biology and biochem. In this video, you're going to learn how to simplify your understanding of electrochemical cells down to just a few key rules that will get you points in seconds on MCAT questions. We're going to cover the two major types of electrochemical cells, galvanic or voltaic and electrolytic, and how they both relate to biologically relevant processes. We'll also go through the major equations that are related to electrochemical cells and how to use them on MCAT style questions. So let's start with the basics. What is an electrochemical cell? They convert energy from one form to another. This is their major function. Specifically, they convert energy from chemical to electrical energy. When we think chemical energy, I want you to think about chemical reactions like redox reactions, ATP hydrolysis. All of those are producing chemical energy or energy stored in chemical bonds. When we think electrical energy, I want you to think current or the flow of electrons from one place to another. Now, as we know from the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created, so our electrochemical cells allow us to convert energy into a more useful form for our purposes. The two types of electrochemical cells on the MCAT that do this conversion of energy are again, galvanic or voltaic cells and electrolytic cells. Galvanic cells are much more likely to be tested on the MCAT, so we're gonna spend more time with this type. So let's start by going through galvanic cell features. All right, so here we have a common schematic of what a galvanic or a voltaic cell looks like. So we're gonna go through the key features and functions of each part of this electrochemical cell. The first thing to note is that conventionally, we always draw the anode on the left. So our left compartment here is called the anode. Our right compartment here is called the cathode. Now you'll notice in each compartment, we have a metal rod and we have a solution. And the solution is also aqueous metal ions. These metals are going to be doing our redox reaction that's happening in our galvanic cell. So we'll notice that we are connected to these two compartments via a conductive material. And we'll notice there's two arrows here because this is going to be where our current of electrons flow. And it's an important rule to know that electrons in a electrochemical cell always flow from anode to cathode. So from A to C, alphabetically, electrons will flow from anode to cathode. So we can see this depicted here. Now this little symbol here is depicting our resistor. And I told you in the beginning of this video that the purpose of these electrochemical cells is to convert energy. So we have a chemical reaction, a redox reaction happening in these compartments and it's converting into electric energy that's going through this current with the flow of electrons. And then we have a resistor, which is turning our energy into heat and light, right? Thermal energy. And this is usually why we use a galvanic cell is that we want heat or light. And so we're gonna attach a resistor to our electrochemical cell, to our galvanic cell, to produce that thermal energy for us, uh, to heat things up or to light things up. Now there's one other feature here, and this is this bar in the middle. This is known as the salt bridge. So an essential part of galvanic cells is that we need to keep the two compartments separate because these reactions are going to want to happen. They're going to be spontaneous. And we need to maintain a separation so that we can capture the electrical energy rather than letting it dissipate into the solution. So we need to keep these separate. However, we need to maintain neutrality so that one solution doesn't dissolve into the other. So this salt bridge allows us to maintain electrical neutrality. And that's all you really need to know for test day on this guy is that it's helping everything stay balanced so that we can maintain our separation and allow for our redox reactions to happen. Now let's get into those redox reactions. So on our anode side, we're going to have a metal. Let's go ahead and have it be lead, PB. And it's going to be our lead solid. And it's going to be immersed in an aqueous solution of the same metal. So lead tends to be 2 plus and it will be aqueous. On the other side, let's say we have copper, copper solid, and we'll be immersed in a copper two plus aqueous solution. Just a note, 
our transition metals that we use for our galvanic cells will form cations, right? Our ionic form of our metals will be cations, which means they have lost electrons. So let's review a few basics about redox reactions before we apply it to the chemical reactions happening in this galvanic cell. So first off, oxidation. Oxidation, by definition, is the loss of electrons. The loss of electrons. And reduction is the gain of electrons. All right, so a atom or a molecule is gaining electrons in a reduction reactions and losing it in oxidation. And these all often work together, redox, where one molecule is losing the electron and giving it to the reduction, the molecule that's getting reduced. All right, so in this electrochemical cell, this is another rule, is oxidation always happens at the anode. All right, oxidation always happens at the anode. A fun little mnemonic here is anox, A-N-ox. We found an ox. So anode is the site of oxidation. This will be true for both types of cells. So that means that our lead is losing electrons. So if you can imagine what the reactant and product is here, you can write that out. But we can imagine that our lead solid is going to lose two electrons two free electrons, and form our lead aqueous, all right? And those two electrons here are going to go into our current, right, fuel our resistor, and also keep going all the way into our cathode, which is our site of reduction, all right? So this is our site of reduction. And our mnemonic here is red cat, red cat anox. All right, so again, now we're gaining electrons. So you can imagine in terms of our reactants and products, our copper aqueous is going to gain two electrons and form our copper solid. So over time, as this galvanic cell, this spontaneous cell happens, the lead solid is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? It's going to kind of dissipate as it gets oxidized and our copper solid is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as more copper solid gets deposited through the reduction reaction. So over time we're going to see a decrease in the, in the lead solid and an increase in the copper solid and when the lead all runs out that's when our cell turns off, right? It cor it's corroded, it no longer works. All right, so those are our basics for our galvanic cell. The last feature here that's already drawn out for us is our terminal charge. So each of these compartments is called a terminal, and in a galvanic cell, the anode is a, the negative terminal and the cathode is the positive terminal. I want you to remember that because, again, remember anodes flow from anode to cathode, and so in a spontaneous cell where we're uh, producing two free electrons, they're going to want to get attracted to that positive charged cathode here. Right, so that's how I remember it, is when we have this nice spontaneous cell, we want to be pulling those electrons. This terminal needs to be positive to attract those electrons. Therefore, the anode, by contrast, is negative. You can also just memorize this. Anode, negative terminal on a galvanic cell. Cathode, positive terminal. The last thing to note here, and this is the big guy, is that by definition, a galvanic or voltaic cell is spontaneous. We don't require an outside energy source to fuel this cell. As soon as we create the setup, these redox reactions are happening and those electrons are flowing without any external input until, again, that lead runs out of solid. Before we move on to electrolytic cell features, I'm Amanda Brem, founder of The Brem Method, and I've been coaching students on their MCAT journey since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content, test taking strategy, and mental fitness skills to help you perform your best on test day. If you'd also like more in-depth interactive lessons on topics like these that also teach strategy and active practice, click the link in the description below to register for our next available MCAT course. All right, let's now briefly go through electrolytic cell features. Again, this is not as highly tested as a galvanic cell, but still important to know the differences between an electrolytic and galvanic cell and its major features. So the first big difference is, as you can see, it's all in one compartment, all right? Both electrodes are immersed in the same electrolyte solution. And the reason why we can do that is because these cells are non-spontaneous, all right? They are not gonna start doing their reactions 
until we put an external energy source. What is that energy source? It's usually a battery. So it usually has some voltage. So again, much like the galvanic cell, it's set up kind of like a circuit with a current and a voltage. Just in this case, the voltage is external to the electrodes. Now we'll still draw the anode conventionally on the left, even though we are in the same solution. And the anode is still the site of oxidation. All right, we still do that just like we do with the galvanic cells. The cathode is on the right, and it's still the site of reduction. And both the anode and the cathode are immersed in this electrolyte solution. All right, so the electrolyte solution has both positive and negative charges. I'll draw the positives here in red, and I'll draw the negative charges here in purple. Now, when the battery is hooked up and is turned on, what we're going to do is we're still going to force electrons to flow from anode to cathode. So we're still going to have that A to C electron flow, but this time it's being forced by the battery. So as we force this flow, the cathode is going to develop a negative charge, right? So the terminal here is actually the negative terminal. This is the big difference in structure um, other than them being in the same solution. And that means that our anode is resulting in a positive terminal. All right, so our anode here has a positive terminal. And so as a result, the electrolyte solution here is going to attract, the anode's going to attract the negative charges, and the negative charges are going to go towards the anode, and the cathode is going to attract the positive charges, so they are going to drive towards the cathode. And so this is our purpose of our electrolytic cell, is to actually move the electrolyte solutions into two different areas of the compartment, where our negative charge is going towards the anode and our positive charges are going towards the cathode. Now, I want you to think to biochemistry, is there anything where we use a voltage to separate molecules based on their charge? If you said gel electrophoresis, you are absolutely correct, all right? This is a gel electrophoresis setup, and this is generally where we'll see an electrolytic cell question. So that's what I meant at the beginning of the video, that we'll see these types of questions even in bio and biochemistry because we use them for our lab techniques. All right, let's quickly recap the differences between galvanic and electrolytic cells. A galvanic cell has two separate compartments for the anode and the cathode, and the anode has a negative terminal where the cathode has a positive terminal. These cells are spontaneous, and that is the biggest takeaway from the differences between these two cells. Electrolytic cells, all the same container. The anode has the positive charge, the cathode has the negative charge, and it is non-spontaneous. It needs an external energy source in order to work and do its redox reactions. Those are the differences. So now let's talk about the similarities. They both have an anode and a cathode, and the anode is the site of oxidation, while the cathode is the site of reduction. Electrons flow in the current always from anode to cathode. And finally, these cells convert energy from one type to another. Galvanic cell converts chemical energy to electric and then to thermal. Electrolytic cells convert chemical to electric back to chemical. We're gonna finish this video with the equations that you need to know that relate to electric chemical cells. The first is a derivation of the Nernst equation, which goes like this. Delta G, which is our measure of Gibbs free energy, equals negative N, equals moles, F Faraday's constant, E cell. So we have our moles of our metals. We have Faraday's constant, which is just a constant. We have our Gibbs free energy, which is a measure of the spontaneity, right? Measure spontaneity of a reaction. And then we have E cell potential. So let's go ahead and dive deeper into E cell with our second equation. So E cell is the overall potential for a redox reaction to happen in, elect in an electric chemical cell. So what does that mean? Um, typically, you may have seen in your book that it's the electrical potential of the cathode, the reduction potential at the cathode, reduction, minus the reduction potential at the anode. So this equation is great, here's the issue. The anode is usually the oxidation potential, not the reduction potential. So we can also rewrite this equation as the reduction potential 
plus the oxidation potential. And how we do that is we just flip the sign. So if the reduction potential at the anode is negative 0.2, we flip it to positive 0.2. And that's how we get the oxidation potential. So our overall E cell, the potential for our our chemical cell to undergo these redox reactions is just the reduction potential, the potential the reduction reaction has to be reduced, and adding it to the oxidation potential, the potential that the oxidation reaction has to be oxidized. So looking at this equation and connecting back to the concepts we learned in this video, negative delta G equals spontaneous, right? It means a reaction will happen spontaneously. So looking at both this equation and our concepts from our lesson, what does E cell need to be in order to make our cell spontaneous? If you said positive, you are absolutely correct. We need to have an overall positive E cell in order to be spontaneous. What does that mean? That means our galvanic cells, by definition, have to have a positive E cell and a negative delta G because I told you that they were spontaneous. So this is one of those shortcuts that you can take on the MCAT. If you know that the cell that you're looking at is a galvanic cell, if you recognize the features, you know immediately that the overall cell potential has to be positive and the delta G has to be negative. Conversely, for a electrolytic cell, a non-spontaneous cell, right? Electrolytic, we're gonna have a negative E cell potential and a positive delta G. And that's as simple as it is. It's just our basic rules. We don't have to do any calculations. We're able to get there immediately just by knowing the content. Now, another cool thing is if you know that your E cell needs to be positive, you can set up your reduction potentials and oxidation potentials to make sure they add up to a positive number. So you'll know just by looking at the cell which numbers you need to flip to add them up to equal a positive number. Our final equation, which is more related to circuits and physics, is of course Ohm's law, V equals IR. The reason why I always mention this equation in electrochemical cell lessons is because again, our electrochemical cells can mimic a circuit with a resistor, a current, and a voltage. So it's important to remember that Ohm's law can be a component of any electrochemical cell questions. And that was our lesson on electrochemical cells. If you found this video helpful, please share it with your pre-med community. Remember, studying for the MCAT is hard and we can use all the help we can get. Hope you enjoyed that lesson and happy studying.